Welcome back, everybody. I'm your guest host of the Zero Hour, Jocelyn McCurdy Keats. And I am here with Rebecca Vallis, Senior Fellow at the Century Foundation and founder and host of Off Kilter, an amazing show that you should definitely go listen to. How are you today? Oh, Jocelyn, it's such a treat to get to be with you. I always love being on the Zero Hour, but don't tell RJ I said this. It's extra fun to get to hang out with you, too. I feel exactly the same. Okay. I'm not going to lie. I was so excited to hear I was going to get to speak to you this morning, especially because you are doing this like intense 10,000 hour investigation into the concept of radical self care, which, you know, I think all of us living in late stage capitalism could use, but especially in these post pandemic years. So, Rebecca, what should a newbie like me learn about this concept, starting oh from ground zero? Jocelyn, so the first place I have to start with this conversation is just to like to level set for your viewers and your listeners. Um, I am by no um, uh, possible stretch of the imagination an expert when it comes to self-care. In fact, that is why I'm doing this series on off-kilter is because I, as long as I have been alive and certainly as long as I've been doing any kind of social justice work, I have been extraordinarily astronomically bad at self-care. I also happen to be someone who lives with chronic illness. And so how that ended up showing up for me is um, pushing myself really, really hard for like 15-ish years of doing this work. And then my body basically um, hit a wall and I had to stop and I had to say it's time to make some shifts. And that was about a year before the pandemic. Um, and so the first couple of years of the pandemic for me were really about asking the question, what does it look like to show up for myself so that I'm able to continue to show up in this work? Um, and I happen to be someone who is lucky enough to have a level of privilege that allowed me to work from home um, at that stage of the pandemic. And that was a big part of starting to kind of really um, ask those basic questions, right? Um, and so fast forward to present day, um, and uh, Off Kilter is a podcast about economic liberation and the shifts in collective consciousness that it will take to actually get there. Um, and we can talk more about what that means and get into some of what um, uh, collective consciousness is and, and how it shows up as the structures that define our day-to-day -day life when it crystallizes into things like laws and policies. So we can get to all of that if you want to. But um, uh, again, fast forwarding to present day, one of the collective collective limiting beliefs that I saw showing up in myself, but also in so many people in this work, friends, colleagues, people in my networks, was this idea that somehow self-care is self-indulgence or that self-care is selfishness. And what that brought me to <laughs> was uh, a heightened awareness and really, I think, a preparedness to interrogate some words that I literally have tattooed on my body. <laughs> um, I have a tattoo. I can't show you right now because it's in a spot that is not safe for television, but I actually have some words tattooed on my rib cage that come from a um, an activist that your listeners and viewers are probably familiar with named Audre Lorde. Um, and as part of a book of essays that she um, authored in 1988 called A Burst of Light, highly recommend if anyone's familiar with Audre Lorde, but not beyond sort of the pop culture awareness of her and, and some of her, um, her brilliance. Um, she has some famous words um, that are um, caring for myself is not self-indulgence. It is self-preservation. And that is an act of political warfare. And the way that people generally understand those words today and the way that that's become well known is the the sort of uh, shorter version of that, which is self care is political warfare. So I have these words tattooed on my body. I've had this tattoo for over a decade, and uh, that's a story we don't need to tell today. But it, it actually resulted from getting myself out of a really bad toxic relationship, right? Um, and uh, and so here I am asking these basic questions about what could self-care look like for me so that I could move through functional burnout and get my body back into a place where I could continue to show up um, as part of um, the, the social justice and economic liberation movement. And so as I started to go back to Audre Lorde and go back to some of the 
um, uh, the, the the writings um, from um, from that book of essays, I I started to also kind of synchronistically have all these conversations with folks in in my life, friends, colleagues, networks, as I was mentioning, of people who were all in various stages of burnout, and I started to realize like. Holy crap, right? Holy crap, Batman. Everybody's going through this. We're all in need of, of this kind of medicine right now. So what is it that I might be able to do that would be in service of me and also in service of, of others? And that was where the idea for um, actually exploring that collective limiting belief, that idea that self-care is, is somehow selfish. Um, what about exploring that on the podcast? And so um, every week since uh, January this year, uh, I've been having a conversation with someone that I know in um, in the, the broader advocacy world who knows more about self-care than I do um, to help me learn, but also in the, the scope of and in the course of those conversations, help my listeners potentially learn something that they don't know about what it looks like to show up for ourselves so that we can show up for this work. Well, and it's it's interesting because I think what you're saying is like we kind of get gaslit into this idea that the best thing we can do for the movement or if you're not in the movement, just like the broader part of society is to ignore everything that would make us not even joyful or thriving, but just like basically more capable of surviving. And we're taught to ignore our own pain and our own distress. And it's very bizarre that like we we all collude in that. It's it's dumbfounding. I mean, do you know why that is? Sorry to ask you meaning of life questions, but I'm so like interested in this. The quickest way to uh, to find your way to my heart is to ask me meaning of life questions because I'm that kind of nerd. So I'll probably tell you the answer is 42 and send you to the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. But then we can we can move on. Um, uh, no, in all, in all seriousness, I mean, um, so I think the place that we have to start with this conversation is to say that um, for anyone who who wants to um, engage with a conversation about self-care or radical self-care, as it's sometimes called, um, you have to push through the commercialized, capitalistic, watered down idea of self-care, right? Hashtag self-care Sundays. And it's not to say that a bubble bath or um, face goop or... Um, a massage or whatever, if you're a person who has a level of privilege and means to access those things um, is bad. I'm not going to say don't take a bubble bath, but that's not exactly what Audre Lorde had in mind um, when she said self-care is political warfare, right? And so I think the place we have to ground this conversation is to say that the concept of radical self-care um, is the result of a conversation that was originally pioneered by women of color navigating life in a society that's rife with sexism, with racism, with homophobia, economic oppression, right? And so that's where this idea started. And Audre Lorde being one of the originators of this conversation of what now has really become a movement, um, that that was what she was anchored in. Um, and so, you know, today, now most of us can't spend five minutes on Twitter. Twitter or uh, Facebook or Instagram or whatever without being marketed $150 face scoop in the name of self-care Sunday, right? No matter what day of the week it happens to be. But um, but I'm I, again, I, I feel pretty certain that um, committing to radical self-care in the way that Audre Lorde called for wasn't actually about face scoop. Um, what she was speaking to was about taking back our power and taking back our lives from grind culture. Um, and, and in the course of that, getting in right relationship to how we show up in social justice work um, and where that starts. And this is really what was um, in the, the spirit of her words was recognizing that we have to first take care of ourselves in order to be able to show up for others, including for our communities. And so that then takes us beyond selfishness, right? It's about valuing ourselves as much as we value the community or the organization or the cause or the movement that we're fighting for because brass tacks without the people who make up the movement, there is no movement. Um, and, and then taking that to another level, right back to your meaning of life question, it's also about recognizing that we're all part of a larger interconnected whole. And so as you start to think about what who is the self, what is the self in self-care? Well, sure, it might be you as an individual, but it's also the collective organism that we're all 
part of. And so as we think about self-care and the way that we've been interrogating self-care throughout this series on Off Kilter, it's not just about individual self-care, it's about thinking about how we care for that larger collective organism. Does that make sense the way I'm saying it? Oh, a hundred percent. And I think, you know, one idea is that I'm getting increasingly done with is the idea of sin, right? Like things are bad or good. And, you know, for me, I look around society and I see a bunch of dysregulated people and all class systems that are overwhelmed, right? Which is like, I mean, even, even the ultra rich, which I spend a lot of time complaining about, I don't have a lot of empathy for them, but at the same time, it's not like these people are thriving. You open a tabloid and it's like, it's one horrific story after another. And I love this idea of what you're saying that it's like to be, to be deeply, I don't even know what the word is. Peaceful, self-protective is perhaps like the first essential contribution you have to make if you want to create social change. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's exactly right. And um, and I, I feel like it's really, really important to um before we get too much farther with this conversation, just to like name, um, and I say this as someone who um, yes, I'm a podcast host, but I'm kind of an accidental podcast host. I'm also a lawyer and a policy advocate, and that's actually really kind of how I come to this work. A lot of my years I've spent fighting for disability rights and justice. And so the my inner disability activist wants to say we have to also really anchor this conversation by noting that. Self-care isn't something that's equitably accessible in our society in all of its various forms. And so I'm going to hold myself up again as an example, as someone who has actually really significant privilege, relatively speaking. So here I've been moving through my own process of reclaiming my life as a sovereign being whose worth doesn't come from my work. And that's very, very important as part of the self-care process. But um, as I do that, I'm also an example of someone with access to immense relative privilege and so I have a job that, as I mentioned before, allows me to work from home. It also gives me a, a significant level of control over my hours. And so one of the things that we've really been exploring throughout this series on Off Kilter is how do we bridge the micro and the macro? How do we think about the barriers, the structural barriers that exist in our society at this moment in, in, in human history um, that stand in the way of people being able to take care of themselves, even in basic, let alone radical ways? And so so one of those uh, prime examples would be that rest rest is not something that is equitably accessible in our society and when you say it in those terms people might be going like whoa and, and it's it you know makes gives me chills every time I say it because of um, how inhumane it is but we don't have universal access access to paid leave. We don't have universal access to paid sick days or, um, you know, uh, and there's a, a range of other policies that we could bring into this conversation that, that further amplify that point. And so again, holding myself up as an example, I, I got COVID finally last November. I had a good run, had a good run before I finally got taken down, but um, finally got it last November. Um, and, and that was a moment when, boy, did I feel my privilege at heightened levels um, because I was able to take paid sick time. And, and what what I was doing was actually taking paid sick days for the first time in my professional life. I'm somewhat embarrassed to say that out loud, let alone on a program that runs on, on TV and on radio. But I also feel like it's actually really important to say because I had spent my entire work life thinking that it was a badge of honor to work through illness, right? That working while sick was a sign in some way of like how um, important I was or how important my work was. But I knew when I got COVID that I needed to rest. I knew that rest was what was going to give me my best chance of not ending up with long COVID. And in fact, just weeks before my team at the Century Foundation had actually published a piece highlighting the research showing that rest is the best treatment for COVID, but that America's broken disability policies don't allow all people in this country to have access to rest. And so I, I just, I feel the need to bring some of that into what we're talking about here so that we don't fall into the trap of making it seem like self-care is um, something that is entirely about personal choice. There also are are structural barriers that we need to address as a society so that we can care for that larger collective organism as we think about what self-care means. So when you're, I think that's like 
a hundred percent the, I mean, you're so right. That's like the first thing that has to be mentioned. Right. And so I think that is where maybe this conversation has turned a lot of people off when, like you said, if you're, if you're on social media, unfortunately, a lot of the times the people carrying this banner are unpolitical white ladies who like sell Tupperware or something, which is fine. I suppose like I'm not, you know, we, how need the we, we all need leftovers to we go. All need it, right? like, but like, it's not when the people who actually need this the most are the people who are least likely to talk about it, especially intrinsic to what we're talking about. It's like intense financial and poverty shame in this country. Like if you're a working class person, people, and you talk about any of these things, it's going to be like, well, you should get a better job or you should get, you know, it's, that's, that's not, we need people to do those jobs. Like what, what is the consequence of mistreating wage workers in America to where they're in a constant state of trauma and essentially creating a servant class that can never have any basic dignity? Like that is not going to go well for any of us. What do you, like, how do you bring this to people? But all of it. Yeah, so I feel like part of, as you were just saying, as you were just speaking, um, Jocelyn, and, and just amen to everything you just said, um, and also with all love to Tupperware too, but but yes, <laughs> um, part of what was coming through for me was um, some words from a poet and activist named Sonia Renee Taylor, who uh, um, I found to be um, honestly one of the oracles in this moment in, um, in time that we find ourselves in, who we would be best served to listen to. Um, and um, uh, she, early in the pandemic, um, she um, she wrote the following words, and I'm going to share them because they ring in my head a lot. And also, it's really in the spirit of her message that um, I, I I think we can we can best get at your question. Um, and so, what she said early in the pandemic was um, early 2020. She said, "We will not go back to normal. Normal never was. Our pre-corona existence was not normal, other than that we normalized greed, inequity, exhaustion, depletion, extract." disconnection, confusion, rage, hoarding, hate, and lack. She continues, we should not learn long to return, my friends. We are being given the opportunity to stitch a new garment, one that fits all of humanity and nature. And again, I get chills every time I, I read those words out loud. And so part of why I bring that in is because um, as you're speaking about um, the poverty shame that goes on, as you're speaking about really just some of the massive structural failures that mean that we we live in an oppression economy, right? And, and they're not just structural failures. A lot of that is by design because of how capitalism especially at this late stage of it is um, really is designed these few bugs um, I feel like at this moment we have and part of what she's speaking to is we have the opportunity to bring about a paradigm shift right and and folks often talk about paradigm shifts that's often something that gets talked about in the advocacy world um, but but I feel like it's actually useful to step back and ask the question what is a paradigm shift and, and how does one come about and so the um, nerd in me wants to say well we have to start by saying the word paradigm comes from the Greek word for pattern and so one way of understanding paradigms is as a set of patterns or scripts or life statements that invisibly set the parameters for what we we all experience in day-to-day -day life. Um, so another way to think about that would be that on an individual level, paradigms show up as the conceptual frameworks through which we experience life, right? The, the beliefs and the stories we tell ourselves, whether we know it or not, but collectively, and this is more to your point, collectively, they show up as a set of invisible beliefs and agreements on our society and our cultural norms are based. And so one great example would be the idea that poverty is inevitable, right? Or that one person can't make a difference. So why should I even try? So part of what I really think Sonia Renee Taylor was, was speaking to is that the pandemic offered us an invitation for a paradigm shift, but that's only if we accept the invitation. And the invitation is not to go back to a normal that never was apart from the parade of social ills that it normalized. And so that's really what we try to do on this podcast is to ask the question, what are those 
collective limiting beliefs, those collective thought patterns that make up the wallpaper in the room that we're all in together or the water we swim in, if you want to think about it that way. And then how do we work together to transmute those collective limiting beliefs into a new way of thinking about how we're all connected to each other and what that looks like for a new way of understanding a social contract. So that to me is is really the way to be thinking and talking with each other as advocates, as social justice movement connected or adjacent um, individuals who are looking to be part of a collective paradigm shift. That's really beautiful, Rebecca. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. And it's, it is, it really is the wallpaper of everything we do from how we work to even how we form friendships and romantic relationships. It's everything. So some of the guests you've had on, what is some of the best advice you've heard to like begin this sort of, uh, you know, psychological activism <laughs> in your own life? I love that. And psychological activism, what a fun way to think about it. I mean, I, I honestly, I think about it as alchemy. Um, because what we're looking to do is to change consciousness through intent and will. And that's something that can be done on an individual level, but it's also something that if we all work together can be done something on a, can be done on a collective level too. Um, so here I am invoking my inner, al- my inner alchemist. Um, so some of the guests that we have had on um, in, in um, this um, past, uh, we can talk about the guests we've had as part of the self-care series, but I also feel like I kind of want to hark back to some of the guests from last fall too, talking about collective limiting beliefs. Um, so um, one of the guests that I was really, really excited to speak with this spring, looking at some of the collective limiting beliefs holding us back from self-care um, was Sarah Jaffe, who is a labor journalist. Folks are probably familiar with her. She's written a number of different books, but but one of her most recent um, books that I find to be really just um, uh, critical for, for pretty much anyone at, alive at this moment in human history is it's called Work Won't Love You Back. Um, and so what that really speaks to and looks at is <laughs> late stage capitalism, right? How we got here. Um, and also it, it sort of asks, it, it makes the point it doesn't have to be this way. Um, and, and helps us think about how not only is there a major collective limiting belief in the form of a human being's worth coming from their work, um, but also how that shows up then in the oppression economy that we live in today. So um, a huge plug for that episode with, with Sarah Jaffe. Um, and, and how does that show up in our individual lives? Well, I mentioned before that part of my own journey here has been about actually um, uh interrogating the inner belief I had for a long time that my own worth is defined by my work. And so I I think part of what I realized as I was moving through burnout was that I didn't know who I was outside of my work identity. And that's a problem if if that's something that resonates with anyone else. I don't know how that speaks to you, Jocelyn. Is that something? Yeah. (laughs) And like, it's hard because you know, we're kind of like in overlapping work families and like everyone, it's, it's very actually Alex Lawson, who's our next guest is constantly telling me, he's like, you need friends that are not political. And I'm like, I don't, how, I don't have any friends. Like, what would we talk about? Like, what do other people talk about? Like, you know, I don't know what other people talk about, but one thing I've been like really contemplating in my own life is how, you know, like, my childhood was a rough situation. And so I think a lot of us who were underserved in some way, psychologically or socially, then give more identity juice and more emotional bandwidth to our work, which then of course makes us less equipped to form relationships, which is like, it's like a cycle that I've been noticing in my own life, you know? And I think, especially as I get older, not to put my family on blast on the air, but they're used to it. Uh, You know, my mom was a single mom who had to work all the time. And understandably, she was not like the most pleasant person to be around. And it's so funny how uh, pop psychology wants me to be like the mother wound. But like, I see it as the capitalism wound, honestly, because like, if you are working all the time, you're not going to be like, you're not going to have the capacity to be the friend you want to be, the parent you want to be, whatever. And I think that there's something sinister with pop psychology where they don't want us to talk about the political structures that shape our behavior because then we're going to start to resist those. Yes. 
I love that. And um, <laughs> I'm also someone who tries not to put my family on blast, but I love you. <laughs> I love you for bringing in the personal experience. I also had parents who worked all the time, right? And um, it, it, and and part of what I think is worth acknowledging is that um, what I think of as work sickness, right? What you were describing, it actually exists at every level of the socioeconomic um, strata that we have in, in this country at this point in the way that our society shows up. And it's true, especially, and perhaps most perniciously and toxically for, toxically is not a word, but I just made it up there, we'll go with it, for the people who it is now for for folks who are are um, wage workers who are are being um, uh, quite literally oppressed so that others may extract value from their bodies. But work sickness exists at at, at higher levels of of income and um, and education as well. And so that was something I also was socialized with with two parents who were college professors and who worked all the time. There weren't weekends because what they understood their role in the world as as was to do the work and it was good work and it was work that was making the world better but that was what I had modeled for me and so that was my understanding of what it looks like to to be to be a human right um and so you know thinking about what does it look like to move beyond um believing that your your work is what determines your worth well I agree with you I think that we're really remiss if we leave that at the individual level. There's a lot of work people can do at the individual level and should, right, with or without a therapist or whoever else you work with. But there's also a collective interrogation that needs to happen as well about about work sickness, um, and that's that's part of what we've we've done on the um, on the the podcast. Um, and and some of what that starts to look at is well, you know, how do we end up with policies like work reporting requirements? Right, so that you can't get food assistance or basic income or um, you know a, a disability benefits or you know anything else without um, uh, uh, either um, proving that you're working or proving that you're completely unable to work. Right, it's like we we have this neoliberal narrative that has so infected the way that we think um, and the water that we swim in and the wallpaper on the walls. Back to those metaphors that it, it shows up then again as as public policies as well that for further um, uh, exacerbate that, that work sickness. Um, but I, I also want to bring in um, uh, another uh, conversation that I found really, really meaningful as part of this series. They've all been amazing. I, I feel like it's hard to pick between them, but because um, uh, the guests have been amazing. But um, just a couple of weeks ago, another self-care practice that emerged through a conversation I had with Jeremy Greer and Solana Rice, who are the founders of Liberation in a Generation. Check out that organization if you're not familiar with it. It's fantastic. Um, it started just a few years ago, and it's already doing incredible movement support work. That conversation was actually about how time travel is a form of self-care as well as an advocacy tool, right? And you're like, where is she going with this? Well, I'll tell you where I'm going with it. I'm very excited. No, continue. <laughs> time travel, usually something that's relegated to the, the mystical, the magical, the science fiction, but it can also show up in the way that we live our lives um, in quote unquote reality um, when we connect with our ancestors and when we also think forward to the future leaders who we're going to be passing the baton to when, when our time in this work passes. And so some of the way that Jeremy and Solana talk about that is about thinking across generations, and that's actually baked into the name of their organization, Liberation in a Generation. Um, but the way that they do that is to understand themselves as part of a stream that isn't about any one person and that encompasses work that never gets completed in any single lifetime. And so knowing your place in the work and then holding that place in the work. I'm getting chills as I say this, just thinking again about Jeremy and Solana and the way that they embody this. Um, that is actually a self-care practice because it allows you to say, I know what my piece is and I trust those who came before me and I trust those who come after me. And so that's actually a practice that they brought forward as something that helps them um, avoid burnout. So I loved that one too. Can I see like all of your routines and meditations and things? Because that's, that's amazing. I love it. And I also, as you're speaking about that, it's like hitting me that the, the way we conceive of ourselves as well, the way we conceive of ourselves in this culture, so individual, like you're saying, not just of one another, but also of history, which is a very ignorant way of looking at the human experience. And, and it, I think, 
understandably creates a lot of grandiosity. Like I have to be famous. I have to be rich or my life doesn't have value. When of course, like that's, that's bizarre. We can't all be the most famous and the most rich that wouldn't even work. And even if it did that, that actually doesn't create meaning or a better world. No, that's exactly right. And so you, you end up with, um, all these folks being like, oh, you know, my job title is what tells me how valuable I am, or, oh, I need to run an organization, or, oh, I need to be on TV, or I need to see my name in print, right? All of that ends up being sort of individual yeah. ego consciousness that really actually can get in the way of showing up in, in a way that allows you to understand um, it's not about you. <laughs> it's actually about the work that's larger than you. And it's about finding your place in that work. Um, and so I know that's something that's been a journey for me and, and definitely one that has required unlearning a lot of what I um, learned and picked up in terms of conditioning and programming and um, being in, in DC based think tanks, um, where a lot of those kinds of um, worldviews are are really um, on display, um, uh, not to put think tanks and DC totally on blast, it exists elsewhere too, but it's especially rampant there. But, um, but I, I feel like Jocelyn, I know we're going to, we're going to end up having a wrap up at some point. And so I, I sort of feel like um, what I want to say in terms of where to leave this conversation is um, the way that I'm understanding this moment in human history is, is really, um, it brings in some words that were shared with me um, uh, by a mentor um, uh, earlier in the pandemic. And that was that living in this moment in human history is either an affliction or an assignment. And we have the choice between whether we want to see it as an affliction and go, woe is me, this is terrible, everything's terrible, or whether we want to show up and say, I accept that assignment. I want to figure out what is my personal mission statement? What is my role in this moment? How can I show up in service of that larger and in interconnected whole that I'm part of? Um, modern day oracles who include some of my dear friends in this work are really talking about this moment as a battle of imaginations. And oppression is what happens when an individual or a whole group of people are living in someone else's dream instead of being free to dream their own dream. And so what does that mean for us? What do we need to be doing right now? Well, we can't just tear down all of the systems of oppression, nor is talking about what we want to tear down going to get us there. What we need to be doing right now is radical imagination. We need to be proactively envisioning the dreams of what we want to build in place of that oppression economy. And, and so that's my charge to everyone right now is to do that radical imagination work. And, and that really is part of self-care for the larger collective organism that's very sick right now. And that is who we need to be showing up for. Rebecca, thank you so much. This has been such a moving half hour for me. And I know for literally anyone else who gets to listen to you and is fortunate enough to do that. And so everybody go binge her show always, but especially on these topics. Thank you so much for being here. And I would love to do this again soon. Me too. Super fun. RJ, I promise I love you too, but Jocelyn, you're awesome. And this conversation was really fun for me too. This is so great.